um, the harder things that are part of our humanity. Like maybe we have awkward conversations sometimes, um, or we don't have the right words. They're not perfect. Um, and it's those sorts of limitations and what a lot of us who write in this area call friction, right? Mm. The friction that comes with being human and like being human together, we experience <laughs> friction, just yeah. not because anyone's being bad or wrong or anything. We're just being human. Um, yeah. And it's just awkward or we say something kind of silly um, and we blush and we feel embarrassed that all of that is actually not something for us yeah. to wish away. Have you ever wondered if our devices are shaping us more than we're shaping them? That's what we're exploring in this episode of the Form.Life podcast as we look at the intersection of technology and spiritual formation. I'm Paul Brandis, and I'm the campus pastor at the Shawnee campus. And I'm Bill Gorman, campus pastor at the Brookside campus. Today, Dr. Felicia Wu Song joins us. She has most recently served as a professor of sociology at Westmont College and brings with her a wealth of insight from her outstanding book, Restless Devices. Dr. Song's work challenges us to examine our relationship with technology through both sociological and theological lenses. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so in this episode, we explore the hidden influences of our digital world, discuss the spiritual implications of our tech habits and uncover practical steps for reclaiming intentionality in our device usage. So join us as we unpack the complexities of modern technology and seek a more mindful approach to our digital lives. Let's jump in now. Dr. Song, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a delight to have you with us. I've really enjoyed reading your book, Restless Devices. It's challenged me uh, as well as encouraged me in my own engagement with technology. And I'm excited to have this conversation uh, with our listeners. So just thanks for joining us today. Sure thing. It's really great to be with you both. Yeah, and we'd love to hear a little bit maybe of your story, what uh, inspired you to write the book, Restless Devices, and what maybe also include in that uh, story, what unique contribution does the book make uh, in a world where lots of people are writing about technology and society? We'd we'd love to, to hear about that. Yeah. yeah, sure. So I've actually been interested in the effects of media and digital technology since the late 90s. Um, okay. yeah, and early on. so um, it's been something that I've always just been curious about because I find it to be such an interesting area of our lives that for a long time, at least in American society, we would adopt and bring into our institutional work life or school lives, but not really have a lot of conversations about mm -hmm. what the effects were on a deeper level. Um, and that was always just something that puzzled me. And so I pursued graduate work studying uh, precisely this, this question of, of what are the social effects of technology. Um, and in many ways, Restless Devices is the product of a couple decades of thinking about mm. um, what is it that people need to hear in order to have good conversations with each other um, about digital technology in our lives. And certainly technology has drastically changed since yeah. the late 90s. If some of us yeah. remember that, we were still jacked yeah. to the wall and still dialing in on our internet and so forth. Absolutely. And so, so much has changed. And so by the time Restless Devices actually got written, I was already speaking to different groups of people, students, pastors, parents, and finding that I was often having the same conversation, that mm. people were feeling stuck. They, they were inundated with technology in their family life, in their work life, in school. They weren't really happy with how the effects were impacting themselves, their family lives, and so forth. They didn't know what to do about it. And so the book um, is really written with an attempt to equip people with a sociological perspective. Um, that's the first half, which says, hey, part of the reason why it's so hard to change our habits and to get unstuck is actually not our fault. 
It's mm-hmm. actually part mm-hmm. of this larger, much more comprehensive set of systems and social landscape that makes it really hard, that pressures us to live this way. And then the second half is for people of faith that says, hey, if if you're a person of faith, if, if you're trying to follow Jesus, um, we actually have tools in our theology, in our church heritage that we can draw from to equip mm. us to to live well, um, and or at least to try to live better um, right. with our technologies. And, and let's explore that together. And hopefully, what I, I'm not a theologian, I'm not a New Testament or Old Testament scholar, uh, but just writing as someone who's a reader herself of these areas of the Bible and theology of just thinking, yeah. hey, Here's some of my ideas. Maybe you all in your respective church traditions can dig into your traditions, right? And your theological commitments and find similar types of tools to equip you. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that's yeah. really helpful. And as I read through the book, I think that 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 sociological lens in the first half was one of the things that I think is is different than some of the other treatments. Mm-hmm. Of, yeah, the unique contribution of the book. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. In terms of of that, uh, and I wonder if you even could you even just say a, a little bit more about some of the things that sociology brings to light about kind of the ecology of technology, some of those mm-hmm. pressures that we face. And um, again, that was one of the parts for me that I think was illuminating in a fresh way around this conversation is there is a sociological dimension to it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think most of us as consumers of technology, um, when we when we are battling um, with our Devi- uh, technologies, we think of our devices, right? We think specifically of our cell phones or our machines, our, our laptops, um, our Netflix, our YouTube. And it's easy to lose sight of the fact that there's an entire digital industry, right? There's there's the tech companies, there's the business side of it, the profit-driven side of it that I think, you know, in the last five, seven years, more and more people are becoming much more cognizant, right? Uh, Aware of of what uh, Facebook and Instagram, what Twitter X, right? What what they have to gain by finding ways of hooking us onto their platforms and and designing the platforms and the devices in certain ways to keep us on their sites using their devices. Um, so I think sociology is always helpful in reminding us that our technologies are are created by people, um, people <laughs> with interests, institutions yeah. with vested interests, and it's and it and it's important for us just to be cognizant and aware, right, of what those interests are, and whether and be thinking about well, do those interests actually serve to benefit us? Uh, does does it serve to benefit my children, my family, my my community, right? Um, and in what ways might it not? Um, the other thing I think that sociology is helpful in is it it often provides like a, a historical view too. Curiously, yeah. I think um, we often think that sociologists are just like number crunchers, um, kind of doing surveys. But sociology actually says. Look, um, there are these long arcs of of yeah. trends and histories that are pushing how it is that our society is the way it is now. So um, uh, there's a significant chapter in that that first half that's that argues that all of the digital technologies that we use today only make sense to us. They're compelling to us because they tap into a cultural logic that was developed during the industrial revolution right oh, yes. that is yep. part yes. of this whole 200 years right of training in valuing productivity in valuing quantification in valuing efficiency and it's because we already value those things that when the device comes along and it's like pop 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 i'm getting things done like yeah this is this is amazing right but it's those those desires and those priorities that we already have kind of deeply kind of embedded in us 
is the result not of our humanity, like, you know, what our createdness is, but is yeah. the result of being socialized in this Western culture that is now a global culture, right, yeah. of industrialization. And I think that is is fascinating. Yeah, that's so helpful. And I, I do think it's a framework that we don't often right. have uh, as we think about why are these devices so compelling? Why are these technologies yeah. so compelling? Whatever it may be. That's so good. Well, and, and I wonder if we even just focus a little bit then too on some of the spiritual aspects. Like how does that Look, impact? Um, we are pastors after all, that's right? right? <laughs> Church people and people of the Bible and are interested in that at, and deeply as well. Yeah, and just how that intersects with our faith and our spirituality in this industrialized world that we right. that we live in um and I, in some of that work to you you unpack some really helpful metaphors so maybe you can respond there uh but there was a number of metaphors that you used throughout that even like kind of the mcdonald's metaphor of industrialization and some of those other things uh that was helpful but however you want to take that but where, where are some of the intersections of that uh on our faith and spirituality yeah, well, I think to the extent that well, we'll just kind of keep moving on this industrialization idea, right? Yeah. So to the extent that we might find ourselves to really value efficiency and productivity, right? Um, and, and there's nothing intrinsically wrong with efficiency and productivity, right? I, I think there's there's wondrous it's it's amazing that we can be creative and productive and find ways to do things in a more streamlined way. Like that's glorious. But to the extent that those become the priority, the goal, the mm -hmm. way in which I establish my sense of worth by how much I can get done or how efficiently I can get it done. And to the extent that I value my devices because they help me reach that priority or hit that sense of worth and goal, then if you are a person of faith, we have we have a problem, <laughs> mm. right? Uh, <laughs> we, we immediately come into a conflict when we're saying, my worth is grounded in my productivity. My worth is grounded in how many likes I can get, right? When yeah. we are a people that says, no, my worth is is in who God calls me to be, the, the daughter of the king, right? Yes. That's, that's my worth. And so um, the ways in which we need to be thinking of our, our technology isn't just this sort of like, there's this external device that's doing harm to me or something. Right? It's more like, no, no, no. It's, it's part of this environment that we are all trying to function in that is, tapping into trying to shape our priorities, our loves, as Jamie mm -hmm, Smith mm -hmm, says, mm -hmm. right? Trying to shape what we think the good life is. Um, and it is competing, right? Uh, you can use the old fashioned term, it is an idol, <laughs> mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, it is competing against the Lord that we profess to, to be following. Um, yeah. And so to me, I think thinking about the place of digital technology in our lives today is really an issue of, of uh, I think, what many people would refer to as discipleship, right? Yeah. Um, I've been reflecting on um, Romans 12, 1 and 2 recently mm -hmm. and thinking about how it is that, that Paul writes about how we, we bring our bodies as an yeah. act of worship, like what yes. we do with our bodies, what how much tapping I'm doing on this screen, right? I bring yeah. my body as an as a as a sacrifice. Why? To do what? To not be conformed, right? That's to right. not be conformed so that I can be transformed with the renewing yes. of my mind, right? Yes. And so I think our technology is part of that conformity. Right. Yes. It is. It is when we are unreflective and just kind of doing what everyone else is doing, or maybe I should say, doing what Apple and Netflix and X want us to do. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not reflective about that, and we're not trying to um, think about or, or shape our bodily lives, our practices, um, to to be that that sacrifice of worship, 
mm-hmm. then then we will find ourselves going down paths that we didn't even want to go down. Like most of yeah. us don't want to go down these paths. We just find ourselves there and we're like, I don't know why I am still watching another episode on Netflix, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> like it just keeps happening. I just keep watching. I'm so yeah. tired. I should go to bed, but we still do it anyway. It's because Stranger Things is so good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, I really am struck and we're about to re-enter into a teaching series on the book of Romans. So your mention oh, there yeah. for us is really timely, Ooh. but how kind of where you ended in its description is is a really uh, powerful and tragic way to define conformity, <laughs> um, which is yeah. again, what what you're referencing there that, that in some ways, I think you can make a strong case that that is uh, the goal uh, within the attention economy and uh, is conformity as opposed to what we see from Paul there, uh, tr- the transforming of our minds so that our our bodies and really whole lives can be that sacrificial right. act of worship. So that's been really helpful. Yeah. And mm. I think it's interesting to bring tr- Romans 12, 1 and 2 into dialogue with uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, where Paul says, you know, we are, and there's some debate on how you translate this word, but we're beholding the glory of the Lord and then being transformed from glory into glory. Yes. Uh, you can also... Debate? Do you translate that as reflecting or beholding? Yeah. But if it, if you go with the idea of beholding, beholding yeah. that there really is this thing: what we are beholding, what our attention is given to, shapes yep. what we become. Yep. Um, yes. In in the midst of that, and obviously, the, yeah, when you talk about attention economy, what we're giving our attention to uh, is a big part of of who we become. What we behold uh, is shaping <laughs> how we how we are formed and how, who we become, how we're either conformed or transformed. Well, and I, I would love, and scripture makes such powerful use of metaphor um, yep. and analogies. And for our listeners that haven't had a chance yet to read your book, I know yep. Bill has mentioned, are there any of the metaphors that you unpack in the yep. second half of the book that you would want uh, right. to maybe explain here in this place that would be uh, relevant to the kind of current place of the discussion? Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think. I, you know, I think you had mentioned McDonald's. Um, yeah. And, I, well, and, and even Michael Pollan and kind of the food, uh, uh, yeah, rules yeah. And, and sort of the, that just that stuck in my imagination, as well as the idea of kind of the seatbelts that we need. And, and initially, cars didn't have these, and we sort of developed these over mm-hmm. time. But have we done that same work in the technological mm-hmm. spaces? Uh, you know, both of those, yeah, I don't know if you want to say a little bit more about those, but both Michael yeah. Pollan and, and seatbelts uh, kind of stuck with me, yeah. images that were in my mind after reading through the book. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, I, I like talking about food, so let's talk about Michael Pollan. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> we do, we do um, too. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so for those that might be familiar, Michael Pollan was writing a book um, that that was trying to get people to, uh, as he put it, eat real food, right? Yeah. To remind right. us that a lot of the food that we might see on the supermarket shelves aren't, aren't actually uh, real quote unquote food. They're they're um, they're part of the industrializing process of food, right? And <laughs> yeah, what does he call? He calls it edible food like substance. I think yeah, is the language exactly. he uses. <laughs> yeah, it always makes me remember mm, delicious. how delicious. Um, <laughs> yeah, the first time I read the wrapper on the American cheese um, thing when I was young, yes, and I yes. remember reading it and saying, "It says American. It says cheese food." Doesn't say cheese, right. and I was like, yes. "Hmm, <laughs> it's very suspicious." But I'm kind of keep yes. eating it anyway because <laughs> um, it's so good. <laughs> it is so good. Yeah. So, um, I think what's interesting about um, thinking about our relationship with technology as analogous to our relationship with food um, is that food is something. We have to eat. Um, yeah. And many of us would argue, well, technology isn't something that I can just throw out the window, right? Like my my livelihood, you know, certain things, I, I can't just throw out my smartphone. So I, I need to have it in my life. But then how is it that I should be um, rightly related to that food or that technology, right? And similarly with food, some of us might struggle with eating disorders, or we might not have very Mm. good diets, right? We might be 
more fascinated by the cereal, you know, the sugary cereals and the cheese foods rather than eating vegetables and fruits. Um, and, and that can also lead to um, poor, poor health outcomes, right? Um, if, if we don't change up those diets. And so I think what's, what's interesting about, uh, and what I love about pollen, um, and then many chefs that are, that are invested in reviving, um, the, the traditions of, of old, old style farming, um, is that they, they argue that the food is actually, it tastes better. The, the vegetables mm. that are grown organically actually taste better than the stuff that is just kind of part of the industrializing of food. And I think as people of faith, there's a similar argument to be made about our lives and technology, right? And no doubt there, there are amazing things that we can do with our technologies. And there's mm-hmm. wonderful experiences we, we can have with people online, we could do things like this, right? Do the podcast. Yes, absolutely. Um, so it's not that it's all bad, but it's more that when we only do this um, mm-hmm. and we forget that there's so much more, right? That food can taste so much better. That tomato yeah. can taste so much better if it was grown organically than in this kind of, you know, uh, mechanized, industrialized way. If we forget that, then we're totally missing out, right? Yeah. And yeah. so, as people of faith that that are um, invited to experience the glory of God, right, through nature, through being with each other in person, through the arts, through music, through beauty, right? There's so much that it that we can miss out on if we are just scrolling away. On our social media for two or three hours a day, right? Yeah. Um, and and so I think the the food analogy is actually really rich and super interesting because it reveals a lot of the complexity, right? That actually exists in our relationship with technology. It's not just like a easy kind of good bad switch, right? right? right. It, it, there's a lot of layers and. And it might even differ between people or families or communities, right? There might mm-hmm. be certain needs that make it so that certain people have to use technology in a different way, that that, that actually does lead to more flourishing because yeah, of their yeah. life circumstances, right? So maybe they, they are homebound, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe they have some other type of limitation and being online is their path to being able to express themselves, right, in ways that otherwise are are generally limited. So, so I think there's there's a lot to explore there. Yeah, are you even thinking about uh, with food the amount that you eat to so the amount of time that you're spending on technology? Maybe you're spending too much, too too little, uh, or maybe you, know, you could even talk about like an allergy. You know, maybe someone also says like I'm not yeah. going to use certain types of technology because I've yes. you know it's not bad for everyone at all yeah. times at all places to yes to use X or to use Instagram, but in my own journey yes. at this moment, like I'm, I'm allergic right. to that. It, it, it's producing. So uh, right. yeah, I do think it's a really rich uh, kind of, yeah, metaphor to continue to explore. Well, yeah. I certainly had that experience actually with X a number of years ago where no. I just sort of realized like, I'm not like how this is forming and shaping me and how I'm walking away after my engagement with this particular technology at this particular moment. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's not leading to my own... Mm-hmm. Flourishing, and in fact, one of the best uh, moments uh, in that kind of season was when there was someone that I sort of only knew of in this online space that then mm-hmm. I discovered was serving at a church literally a block and a half from oh. where I was serving. Yeah. And I could log off and honestly go knock on his door and say, hey, can we get to know one another in person and mm. break bread at our neighborhood's restaurants and get to know one another and read a book in person together and discuss it. And yeah. um, so I that That's metaphor so cool. really that metaphor really does connect with me. And mm. I kind of really haven't I mean, sometimes you grow out of allergies. I haven't really gone back mm-hmm. to that <laughs> yeah. technological space yeah. Um, yeah. in any sort of meaningful way. And mm-hmm. uh, and there's a cost to pay for that uh-huh. in some in some aspects. Uh-huh. But yeah. um, mm-hmm. so that metaphor is really is a powerful one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I wonder too, Doctor Sang. There's so much that is 
obviously always changing and developing in the space of technology. And so even from the time that Restless Devices came yeah. out, uh, we've since had, you know, these generative kind of AI tools like Midjourney mm-hmm. or ChatGPT and some of these other tools that have now come on the scene. Mm-hmm. What are you seeing uh, yeah. with those? How is that changing any of this conversation? Are there fresh things that we should be thinking about or questions that we should be asking um, of those of those technologies that are different than what we've been asking before, or is it pretty similar? I just loved you know yeah. any of your thoughts as you're following sort of you talked about from the '90s and dial up so to the, smartphones, and now kind of the the next thing that everyone's talking about is these yeah chatbots and image generators yeah. and those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, I think um, the gender of AI conversation is interesting because there's a way in which it actually brings the 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 discussions about the digital back yeah. to mm. where it was earlier when um, there was a lot more um, interest and exploration in what was then called human computer interface <laughs> okay <laughs> um, and this was back pre social social networks, right? Okay. When mm-hmm. when uh you would be online and and you would just be on AOL talking to strangers. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um and I think what's interesting is about AI today is um and what folks talked about early on in the 90s is is our profound human capacity to attribute mm. humanity in the machine. Yeah. Right? Like we know it's a, we know it's a bot. <laughs> like we know that the AI is merely sifting through all of the data that's already out there, right? It's not, it doesn't have a brain that's actually sentient, right? And creative. It's got a very amazing, incredible algorithm that it's crunching, you know, using tons of servers and databases to to crunch data through but it's just a machine and a formula yeah and our capacity you know and it starts you know like we've been living many of us have been living with it you know with siri and alexa right like we already right. speak or we speak to our cars or whoever right yeah all our smart devices are already have already been ai you know it's always already been with us um, but I think, again, what what being a sociologist always reminds me of is to ask certain questions about who's producing or creating mm-hmm. this technology. Mm-hmm. What are their assumptions? Um, what is their experience of the world, even? Mm-hmm. Um, and and therefore, how it shapes what gets built. Um and then, uh, so there's the creator. So that's that's the scientist, right? Um, the the inventor, the technologist. And then there's the business. Yeah. There's mm-hmm. the industry, right? Who's selling? Who yeah. wants this in every classroom, in every home, in every interface of our lives, so that they can make money? And what do they get out of it? What are they getting from me that appears to be free, but uh-huh. actually isn't free? Right. right. What data of mine are they hoovering up and making a lot of money off of that I don't even know about? Um, and and you know, I know for some of us we are more protective of our data than others, so that that might yeah. be of interest to some some more than others. Um, but I do think that one of the most important questions as as people of faith is to ask, you know, as as the as the line seems to be blurring between machine and human, right? As the machine seems to be able to imitate the human Mm -hmm, more mm -hmm. and more, we need to be asking the question, um, what is the part of our humanity that we need to protect or not give up on, Mm -hmm. right? Um, and some of that's like the beautiful side of things, like, 
Um, I don't think there's any AI can, that can like smell the glorious smell of a freshly baked pizza yet, right? <laughs> like they're like computers are still way behind on smell technology is what I understand, <laughs> right? Um, but even like the harder things, yeah. right? Um, the harder things that are part of our humanity, like maybe we have awkward conversations sometimes, um, or we don't have the right words. They're not perfect. Um, and it's those sorts of limitations and what a lot of us who write in this area call friction, right? Mm. The friction that comes with being human and like being human together. We experience <laughs> friction, just yeah. not because anyone's being bad or wrong or anything. We're just being human. Um, yeah. And it's just awkward or we say something kind of silly um, and we blush and we feel embarrassed that all of that is actually not something for us yeah. to wish away. Yeah, to get rid yeah. of. That's right. right? Um, that, that That isn't like the sin part that we're supposed to be like casting off. That's just yeah. part of being human. And there's actually a lot of beauty that comes from learning about our own frailty and limitations yes. and each other's frailty and vulnerability, right? That that's part when we, when we engage that friction and learn to love each other and be gentle with each other, that's actually a way to discover and experience God's love, right? That that's God's love for us. Um, and that's how we can be God's love for other people, right? Um, and so for me, I, you know, because like you said, you know, in my line of business, I could be chasing a technology every other day, right? There's anytime yeah. I write anything, there's like a new thing right, already right. coming out. For me, like, I think the most important thing in my, in, in all of our work, but what I want to spend my time also kind of exploring it or finding better ways to articulate is to, to stake down what is it that's part of our humanity that we really need to cultivate, right? That we need to not mm -hmm. be afraid of, that we need to say, hey, it's okay, right? This is a beautiful part of us. Um, and this is part of our journeying um, in our life with God. Yeah. Well, and I love thinking about that. Uh, that's so powerful. But uh, in the in the person of Jesus well, and how yes. he would have embodied some of what you're, I'm, I'm imagining, right? And trying to think well, over different stories in the Gospels where mm -hmm. um, there's different uh, sort of images or sort of uh, a bit of that sort of in his in his humanity and um, just yeah, yeah, some imaginative thinking around his relationships with his disciples mm -hmm. and his friends and his followers and. And how all of that must have been there, um, and that yeah. there's just something, there's just something so powerful about the divine uh, humbling uh, yes. himself in that way, and and it, yes. and just to strengthen the point that it shouldn't be something that we're trying to to cast off or sort of do away with uh, by virtue of uh, the approximation of a relationship with with an Oof. AI. And I have a. Yeah, I mean, I, I get why there would be an impulse or a draw for someone to want to try to enter into a type of relationship with an AI bot. Um, but yeah, I appreciate how you're uh, subtly pushing in on that a little bit. Yeah, John Kilner, who wrote the book uh, Dignity and Destiny, it's on the image of God. And one of the points that he makes, I think is so powerful, is that to be human we often talk about in terms of the image of God even being in certain strengths or capacities that we have. And he's actually, that's a really a misreading. Like to be mm. humans actually have certain weaknesses and the storyline mm. of the Bible is one where the Lord is our strength. And so there's weakness mm. that comes from not only our fallenness, but an appropriate weakness that comes uh -huh. from our finitude that yes. is a good. Mm -hmm. yes. um, yeah. and, and I think sometimes even this whole conversation around technology is to try to sometimes to try to transcend that finitude yes. and that, yes. uh, the, the appropriate weakness that we have, that we're designed to be dependent oh, on please. the one who created us. And that that's where we find joy. Um, that's where we find fulfillment. Uh, that, that like inherent finitude weakness is not something to be overcome or done away with, but to be embraced is just as you're saying, this the friction of, of being human and all of that. So uh, I'd love as we kind of, turn a corner here and, and maybe uh -huh. th think a little more practically. One of the parts that was so helpful to me is how 
in the book, you walk through the Freedom Project that you had your mm-hmm. students participate in uh, when you were teaching yeah. in the undergrad context. And you'd have a, a, a fresh class of students each mm-hmm. fall and you'd invite them into this Freedom Project. And I would, would you just describe a little bit of that and maybe just invite our listeners into if they wanted to try something uh, like that on on for themselves, what, what that might yeah. look like? Yeah, sure. Um, so the Freedom Project is a set of experiments that I had my students do um, that was intended, as the title says, to encourage them to a life of freedom with their technologies. Yeah. Um, so often we think that the technology is what brings us freedom. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was flipping it to say so many of us have become dependent in ways that are unhealthy with our technologies that we need freedom in our relationship with our technologies. And so um, the way it's it's sequenced is, is actually a little... Um, flipped on its head compared to a lot of like typical 40-day detox type um, (laughs) plans. Um, So I actually start with the hardest thing. Um, I start with the 24-hour digital fast. um, And that's hard. Um, And I, and I, I get it, you know, that's so hard. But the point is not to see if you can the point is not to try to succeed or, or or what I would tell my students is you don't fail the assignment if you don't make it, right? Mm. Um, the point is to feel what it feels like. Yeah. Just to just to know, right? And to and to take time to reflect on what what is that. And it's fascinating because some students actually find it completely liberating. They're like, mm. that was the best 24 hours I've experienced <laughs> in a long time. And others are yeah. complete basket cases yes, and strung yes. out because it's just very anxiety producing. Um, and so that that first step is just a, a kind of like, okay, shock to the system. What is, what is the nature of my reliance on technology? Yeah. And then we move into, now let's do a little observation of our usage of technology, whether that's just trying to pay attention to um, a, a whole day, right? Spending a day thinking the question, then you have the question, oh, wait, why am I picking up my phone? Um, what, like, is it to actually do something um, on my phone or is it because I'm in a socially awkward situation or, you know, and so just spending time observing our own habits. Um, and then the best part of the Freedom Project is actually towards the end, um, which is, you know, once we take some time to reflect and realize how dependent we might be on our devices, and perhaps we aren't terribly happy about that, then we can try to experiment with what can we change? What can we change with our digital habits? Um, And so I give my students a a series of, of experiments that they, a menu to choose from, and it could range from, uh, you know, uh, for four days in a row, I am going to um, wake up and not spend the first, I, I spend my first 15 minutes not on my phone, right? And I'm going to do something else. And they have to write down what they're going to do, you know? So some are like, I'm going to do 20 sit ups, right? Others are like, I'm going to color in my coloring book or I'm going to journal, right? Um, and, and then others might be like, well, that's just way too hard, right? So I say, that's fine. You know, like maybe you just go to bed without your phone right under your pillow. Maybe you just go to bed with your phone right beyond your arm's length reach, right? Just, just mm. on the other side of the room. Just so if you, if you really need it, you have to get out yeah. and <laughs> get it, right? Um, or for some... Uh, a favorite is um, so many of us use our devices to multitask. Uh, so what would it be to monotask, right? So yeah. so maybe it's something as obvious as what all your teachers tell you, like if you're doing your homework, just do your homework, right? Um, <laughs> but maybe it's something maybe more fun, right? And kind of interesting, like when you're driving, what would it be like not to listen to music or a podcast, right? To just drive, Right. Or, yeah. or, or for like the, the more advanced, you know, like really confident, like if you're eating at the cafeteria alone, right, what would it be like not to look at your phone and just to eat? Right. Um, and so the whole point is just to 
try something different, try a new experiment, and hopefully, and I think a lot of students do experience that after a number of days, there's actually something truly liberating about it that they're like, oh, this is actually better, right? Like, I actually like this more than what I was doing before. And, and then there's the encouragement, okay, well, maybe you can keep it up, you know? Um, it's up to you, you know, there's no requirement. But uh, as you were saying before with the, um, you know, getting off of X or, you know, it's just like, this feels great. Like, why don't yeah. we want to do something else, yeah. right? And that's that's my whole impulse is is that we, we spend so much time talking about FOMO, like missing out on what's happening online. But I think there's so much missing out on other things, right? Yeah, like yeah. we're actually cutting ourselves off from so many other things that we just we just kind of forgot, you know? Like we just forgot that we liked playing the guitar or we forgot that we, you know, actually liked painting or, or whatever it is. Um, and so we just have to remember and build mm. that into our life habits. Mm. That's super helpful. It is that I would love to point people to that resource. Is that in the book? I'm, I'm mm -hmm. assuming yes. that there's yeah. a, you kind of break that all down. Wonderful. Well, we'll link to that in the show notes because I'd love to be able to uh, point people more specifically if they wanted to try that. I spent some time working as a, as a uh, campus, a college campus chaplain. And I oh, yeah. was sitting here the whole time thinking about, <laughs> uh, the challenge of that kind of exercise with uh, that wonderful generation uh, of, of humans that I've recently gotten to work with and uh, just the opportunity that it must have been to get to do cool. that. So I wish I had that resource when I was doing that work. Yep. But thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, sure. And as we wrap up, is there anything... Uh, you know, that you feel like we haven't covered that would be helpful to our listeners? Um, anything maybe that we as church leaders, as pastors, mm. we uh, this podcast with you is one of the ways we're trying to mm. form and equip our people in uh, mm -hmm. positive uh, ways are around this space. But anything that we uh, should have asked you that we didn't get to? Any <laughs> questions that should have been should have been on our, our list that we missed as we uh, turn the corner here to closing out our time? Um, you know, I, I think I just have mainly a, a word of encouragement for you and for people that are thinking about technology. I, I think it's it's very easy and I, I am challenged with this myself, is it's just very easy to get discouraged. Mm. Right. It's it's yeah. it's, it's grim, right? <laughs> I mean, when you yeah. do the readings of the studies and and you look at, you know, maybe what habits we see in ourselves or in our own yeah. households or in our yeah. communities, like it's not pretty and and it's very embedded. Um, and I think, um, you know, my hope and what I keep working on myself um, is that um, I need to not just focus on the, the negative of what the technology mm -hmm. is doing. I, I want to keep on trying to unlock what is the fullness of life, right? That God has for us, yes. right? That, that we need to be leaning into in this particular time, right? What, what is the salient thing that can be life-giving um, that isn't going to be corny or like legalistic or whatever, right? It's just like, what is the thing that, that those of us in this particular plight will actually be like, yes, please, more, you know, like I want that. And how do I provide that for people that I might be able to create space for? Um, and how do I create space in my own life for that? I love that. Thank you. That is encouraging. Uh, our final question is one we do on every podcast as a way to get to know our guests, our generous mm -hmm. guests that have spent time with us. And we just, it's a get to know you. We want to learn more. And so we wonder if you could do anything else uh, for so, work and you have a lot of important work as a college professor and then as a writer and author and speaker. Yeah. But if you could have had another career, a different occupation, a different job, what might that have <laughs> What might, that, what might that have been? Yeah. I love getting to be a pastor, but in another <laughs> life, I might have been a sports broadcaster. So yeah. <laughs> what, is, what is that answer for you? Oh, well, we could talk about this for a long time. Uh, <laughs> um, so um, I very recently, um, well, actually during COVID, 
I started learning to play. I started to learn to play bass guitar. Okay, that's amazing. Um, for our church's worship band, <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm I'm a fairly petite person, um, and I have small hands, <laughs> um, and I just think it would be amazing to become like a bass guitarist in a funk band. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's just, like that when I listen to those those players and funk bands now, I'm, yeah. and the way they slap, I, I mean, know, I'm just like, right. that would be so amazing if I could do that. So, so that's what I would, yeah. If I could, answer. if I could have another life to live, and I had, you know, I was a bigger person <laughs> with bigger hands, bigger fingers, <laughs> oh, I would a be a, a pub. A uh, bass player in a funk band. In a funk band, I love. I that love so that much. so much. Yes, I love this question because you just I never know. know. You never know what people are going to say. <laughs> it has and it's been always... an incredible question. We've gotten some really amazing answers, including <laughs> yeah. that one. Yeah, That's pretty good. So we have not awesome. gotten that answer before. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't think we've gotten any repeat answers. Oh, I don't think we have. So it's always amazing. been fresh. So that's that's amazing. Thank you. Well, yeah, Doctor Song, thanks so much for your time and your generosity and just the the amount of. Um, work that you've done not just recently but since the 90s to think about to reflect on this and and the work that you've done to distill that uh, for us both in your writing and then just here today we're really grateful for you and how you've stewarded the gifts they got to give me so thank you so much for being with us today thank you it's been a real pleasure yeah, thanks. And thank you listeners for tuning in and we'll have uh, links down in the show notes to Dr. Uh, Song's book. And uh, thanks for tuning in and joining us on the form.life. 